Brian Pitts. I enjoyed the talk. Uh, you've told us uh, a lot about various theories of gravity and what they predict. If I can ask a sort of qualitatively Bayesian-inspired question, uh, if I want to figure out what I should believe about gravity, I'll need more than that. I'll need some kind of weighting in terms of plausibilities, and sometimes you gesture at some of those things. Uh, did you, uh, do you think there's anything useful and relatively objective to say in terms of weighting by plausibility so I can figure out what theory of gravity I should believe in? Or do you purposefully avoid that because it seems useless I'm, and premature? I'm totally agnostic. I'm totally okay. agnostic. And let me say more. Depending on where I give this talk, I get different reactions to different bits of that plot. So if I was um, visiting John Ellis's um, uh, turf, a lot of the people would stand up and say, you know, there's no point in all this. If I go to a relativist group, um, they say, why are you looking at massive gravity? It's completely pointless. The only thing you should look at is scalar tensor. And so I think these priors are prejudice-driven. I think there are good prejudices, but they are prejudice-driven. And I'm not saying John would say that to me, but. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's just my colleagues. It's just your colleagues, just your colleagues. <laughs> uh, Pedro, can I ask you a quick question too? I mean, Relating what your talk to the previous talk, Paddy was talking this morning about all these huge arrays of inflationary models, and of course, one's excited by that because of all the recent data constraining those models. Now, you're talking about all these different ways of changing G and things. I'm not quite clear how I sort of <coughs> marry up the sort of variations of G with all these sort of different inflationary models. Mm. Can you link them in some way? I mean, you don't have constraints explicitly from. Um, okay, no, I can't. I mean, I think there will be theories here which could lead to inflation. That's the first thing. My focus over the last few years has been very much at... We're going to get very little inf information about the inflationary area, right? We're going to get four numbers. You know, we're going to get the spectral index. We're going to get the, ro the, the slope. We're, we've now got R. We might get the tensor. We might get a little bit on non-Gaussianity, but there's very little information. I'm much more interested in the now, or the last few redshifts, where we'll have these maps of large-scale structure evolving over time over out to redshift 3. So there's going to be much more information on different scales and at different times. So my focus is then. I understand. But is it in principle true that for every one of these theories, there's going to be some impact on your model for the, for the inflationary epoch, for example? It's po yes, I, I'm, it's possible. It's, you know, it's possible that you can get each one of these theories and construct a theory of inflation within, within those models. So there are, in principle, constraints on these models from all the, the new data. Yeah, I just don't think there's a lot, but yeah. Okay. yeah I, uh, John Ellis, I just wanted to make the obvious remark that you know, Starobinsky was an example of a modified theory of gravity, uh, which failed, apparently, if you believe bicep 2. And uh, Higgs inflation would have been another modification of at least the way that gravity couples to scalar fields, which now also fails for the same reason. So you know, I think we have learned something. Maybe it's not directly relevant to the sorts of modifications of gravity that you were talking about, but I think we have got some information. Patrick Dürer. Um, I, I share the criticism that has been um, articulated already that most of these alternative theories of, of gravity have a very ad hoc character. You can always cook up any theory of gravity describing all sorts of empirical data. So I think um, we should, the motivation for um, dealing with alternative theories of gravity is twofold. One, learning about the structure of GR and potential modifications uh, from a purely, let's say, didactic point of view, like um, uh, concerning the PPN parameters, the equivalent principles, but also things like the correct GR limit. W one thing that you mentioned in your talk is that the omega parameter, um, if the omega par parameter goes to infinity, you recover GR. Um, but this is interestingly wrong. Um, FR gravity, which is perfectly compatible with mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the observational data, corresponds to a scalar tensor theory with omega equal to zero. Mm -hmm. uh, so this claim is actually wrong that um, mm -hmm. scalar tensor theory for omega uh, approaching uh, infinity um, corresponds to GR, and then of course the second motivation is maybe um, from um, from a, um, an effective field theory point of view. Just what could we expect? What kind of um, qualitative um, novelties in an alternative theory of gravity? Are you asking? Are you, you're no, asking. Th th no, this is, this is a statement. 
but you asked a question, what would we expect from effective field theory? Well, at late times, if you apply the effective field theory optics, you expect nothing. You expect Einstein-Hilbert plus a scalar field. Yeah. That's all. Um, um, well, this is a comment about this issue about inflation and these theories of gravity. I mean, there's about a thousand, there are about a thousand models of inflation. And um, so when d people wrote this paper about Planck being evidence for inflation, about two weeks ago I pointed out whatever the Planck data had been, there will be a model proving that. So um, there, is a, there is a thing in statistics called when you have too many parameters, you always get a better model, a better fit, but you have to penalize for the freedom you've given yourself. So if you've given yourself a thousand papers with different models, this is always going to be, you're always going to predict what, what is observed. And in fact, I said this two weeks ago, and now, as you know, things have changed as of yesterday, and there is a model there as well. And um, so I think it's actually evidence against inflation, not for inflation, that we have this fit to the microwave background. And the only way out of this would be exactly something like what you said in your talk. Suppose. Suppose actually R square inflation was the best fit, and suppose we found evidence in gravitational physics using the things you said towards R square inflation. In that case, I think indeed there will be evidence for inflation. But I think as it is, I think it's a big kind of uh, misunderstanding that because we have this very great fit, this is proof for inflation. Any observation would, have be, would be a great fit for inflation. I agree. So um, I would like to. Uh, uh, Thank Pedro for a, a very provocative talk. Well, not a very interesting talk, and if we could show our appreciation.